welcome back to another Sunday service from Exmouth Chapel. We're really pleased that you've been able to join us today, whether on DVD or online. I'm sure for those members of the chapel watching this morning, you've missed being here in person. Ruth and I certainly have missed our church family gathering. However, we are really encouraged by the many more people who have been able to join us in recent weeks through our online ministry. And in fact, we know that the number of views on our videos shows that more people are seeing the service, hearing the word preached, joining us in worship than normally do of a Sunday morning. It's not a substitute. It's still not the Sunday gathering of the local church, but be encouraged that the Lord is using this time of separation. And uh, if you are one of those people who has joined us, maybe even for the first time today, you're very welcome. And our prayer is that you'll be blessed and also challenged, encouraged and shaped by this morning's time together uh, in God's word, in worshipping him. And we ask that the Holy Spirit would be with you, that he would minister to you as well. And so let's ask for God's blessing right now as we turn to him. Our Heavenly Father, our Sovereign Lord, we thank you that you have made a way that we can still meet together in this time of separation. And as we gather, albeit virtually, we ask that you would help us to glorify you in our own homes, with our families, or with whoever we might meet today, or see, or speak to on the phone. May we take time to enjoy you, to seek your presence with us, but at the same time to revel in the assurance that you are always with your people, that you are always present with us. May we look to the Lord Jesus Christ as our example, and may we again look at his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and may we be again encouraged by the fact that he is at your right hand father right now interceding for us we thank you that the lord jesus changes everything for us would you be pleased to meet with us today in the in the power of the holy spirit we ask this in jesus's mighty name amen Hear these words as we begin our worship from Psalm 100. We had uh, this passage a few weeks ago as our call to worship, but we're going to have it again because there's just such a joy to the words and they really help us to ready our hearts to sing to the Lord. Hear these words. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And now we're going to sing some of those words. So let's join together and lift our voices to the Lord.
I think Paul must have been thinking of some of those words when he wrote the verse in Philippians 4 that says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. You know, we always live in the day that the Lord has made, whatever it has in store for us. Now, perhaps while you're getting your breath back, I'll just give you some notices. First of all, a reminder that our missionary updates are being posted onto YouTube. There are two of them at the moment. One is a roundup of prayer points from a range of missionaries who are often spoken of in our missionary prayer meetings. Um, and so please do uh, check that one out and just make a list of the prayer points perhaps for yourself. Um, and also please do add to our prayer points as well ahead of the next one. Please, if you have an update, do let us know. Um, the second one is slightly different. It's a little bit longer. It's an interview with Lucas Fernandez Paz. And that name might not mean too much to you at this point, but Lucas is coming to work at, for Word of Life UK. And Word of Life UK are an organisation that we've supported here at the chapel for many, many years. Uh, you'll know possibly Dave Kelso uh, and his wife Sherry, who used to come down and do youth ministry here, and Dave used to preach. Um, Dave and Sherry are now directing their ministry entirely at their local church and so they've left Word of Life and uh, Dave's replacement is at the moment going to be a man called Lucas uh, as I mentioned and Lucas and I caught up on Zoom earlier in the week and uh, it was really good to catch up with him he's a really encouraging guy he's uh, really on fire for the Lord and he's a, a real encouragement when it comes to evangelism and to prayer. So please do uh, have a look at that interview and pray for Lucas as he comes to the UK as soon as lockdown permits. And his wife, Evelyn, they're, I think, still, uh, still awaiting the arrival of their second child. So please do pray for them um, and please do catch up with the interview. Also, just a reminder to pray for the young people. They're still meeting on a Friday night. Um, and we're also looking uh, at how we can possibly um, put on a youth alpha on a Wednesday night that allows them to respond a little bit more, maybe using some, some kind of video tool. Uh, so do pray for plans for that. Um, and also pray for our evangelism as a church, even at this time, as to whether we do something like that for adults as well. Uh, finally, I would just encourage you uh, once again to um, send in any specific prayer points that you have uh, and to remember also that the prayer chain is still available thank you to those who use the prayer chain it's really good to be able to pray intelligently for people and i think it's been really important in recent days and weeks for a number of people so please do uh, don't be backwards in coming forwards with your prayer requests we'd love to pray for you um, as well we're going to sing a new song now um, and it's one that Ruth and I picked up at a conference uh, back in January and uh, we've wanted to share it with you. Ostensibly it's a children's song, but actually it has real relevance uh, to anybody going through perhaps difficult times of any sort. Um, it's called Jesus Strong and Kind by Colin Buchanan and I think many of you are going to love this one. Uh, it's very simple to pick up and uh, it's not really for children, it's for, for anyone who needs it. And so we pray that it's a blessing to you um, as you learn to sing it. Jesus said that he 
We're going to take a moment now to join together as a congregation in prayer for our world, for our country, for our community and for our church family. Our God, holy and awesome, who seeks to dwell with us, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your perfect nature. We are in awe of you, God, and we thank you that those two statements are true, that you are high, that you are holy, that you are almighty, but that you are also seeking to draw near to us, sinful people, and Lord, we are staggered by your grace. And as we come to you, we thank you for the boldness that we can come with because of the Lord Jesus. But Lord, we recognise that we, as human beings, are prone to wander. That there have been times in this week when we have wandered from the path that you would have us walk. That we have sinned, that we have turned away from you in our thoughts and in our hearts and we confess those times now and we ask for your forgiveness and we take this time of quiet now to search our hearts and to examine ourselves. And our Lord, we thank you that you give us assurance, despite the fact that we don't deserve it, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and you are just and you will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. And we claim that promise now in Jesus' name. And now, our God and King, we come to you with our requests and we thank you for the confidence which we have before you, that if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us. And therefore we pray for our world. Lord, you told us to pray for those in authority over us. And so we bring before you our government, our prime minister, our cabinet. We bring before you county councils. We bring before you our local council. We bring before you those who are in charge of running the NHS, of running the police, of other emergency services at this time. And we thank you that you have set them in their positions for the flourishing of human society. Father God, we ask for wisdom from you for them in this difficult time, in this crisis of COVID-19. But we thank you that when we ask for wisdom from you, we are asking the God of perfect wisdom, who knows everything, to whom nothing is a surprise, who formed wisdom itself. And so, Father God, we thank you that we can bring our authorities to you and ask for wisdom for them. And we pray for all those who are scientists involved in the search for vaccines, in the search for treatments for coronavirus. And for medical staff, for doctors, for nurses, for cleaning staff, for anyone involved in social care at this time, for those who are involved in driving ambulances, in visiting people door to door, would you protect them, Lord God, and would you bless them? Would you use them to save by your mercy and grace? Lord, would you, in this time, be with all those who work in care homes or who visit the vulnerable in their own homes? Again, Lord, we pray that you would protect and sustain. And Lord, we pray for key workers who provide essential supplies. We pray for those who ensure that we have food that we can buy to eat. We pray for them and we pray for your sustaining strength for them as well. And we give thanks to you, our ultimate provider. 
We pray for our community, Lord, and we pray for those who are vulnerable in our neighbourhoods, that you would make them known to us and that you would show us how we can encourage and support and bless them in your name. And we pray for children who are in their own homes at the moment who cannot be at school. We pray that you would help them and their parents as they learn, that you would bring peace to families in Exmouth and Lord, that you would help churches to be a part of how you accomplish that. And we pray also for the possibility that children will return to school and we pray for safety for that if that occurs, but only you know the future. We pray for the lonely in our communities. And we ask that you would bless them, that you would draw near to them and that you would use this time to reveal yourself to those who do not know you. And we pray for the grieving, for those who have lost family to COVID-19. And we ask that you would comfort them in this time of separation, when perhaps they haven't been able to attend funerals when they haven't been able to grieve properly in the normal way. And Lord, we pray also for our church family and we ask for your specific blessing for those who are fighting medical difficulties at the moment. We pray for Mo and we thank you that she's been able to return home. We give you praise for that and for answered prayer. But we pray that you would continue to sustain and uphold her that you would heal and that you would rest her. And we pray for Brian as well, that you would help him as he cares for her. Give them peace, we pray. And Lord, we pray for all those others who are dependent on treatment long term. And we think of Harry, and we think of Janet, we think of Di and Tony, we think of Gerald and Janet. Lord, we give you praise for the medical staff who are working with them, but we recognise the long and difficult time that they are in. And we ask for your blessing upon them, even now. And Lord, we don't forget those others that are on our hearts who need your sustaining strength, your help, your wisdom and your guidance at this time. And we pause again to bring them to you. And so, Lord, we pray for our church, that we would be making disciples, but that, Lord, we would be open to being discipled ourselves. And we ask that you would help us to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us to consider others above ourselves. Help us to be humble. Help us to be gracious and kind. May we fix our eyes upon him, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we ask that in your mercy, you would help us to run the race that you have set before us. We ask this in Jesus' name.
Today we're really thankful to Ashley Richards. Ashley is one of our visiting speakers who often comes to the chapel to preach. And uh, before lockdown, he was due to come as part of our series in the life of Abraham uh, and to, to share with us. Um, but obviously lockdown changed our plans a little bit. However, not dissuaded or uh, foiled by such trivialities, Ash got in touch to ask if he could be of any help in uh, delivering some of the online ministry and we took him up on that. Uh, we're really thankful for his offer and we really appreciate it. Um, and so Ash is going to be sharing with us this morning uh, via the wonders of uh, a video and he's going to be preaching on Genesis 15. You'll remember uh, that last week uh, we looked at, uh, at Abraham at the end of Genesis 14 and his choice of two kings and Ash is going to take us on now uh, into chapter 15 and the promise that God makes to Abraham. So if you have your Bible at the Bible with you, uh, please do open it to Genesis chapter 15 so that you can follow along. Good morning everyone, uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity to share God's word with you this morning. Before we uh, get into the scriptures together, I want to recommend a book to you. It's called The Beginning of Wisdom. You can see it on screen now. It's a, a book written by a man called Leon Cass, a, a Jewish theologian. It's, it's arguably the most comprehensive commentary written on Genesis today, and it's also written in a Jewish perspective. It's a book that fascinates me uh, and has helped me immensely in my press preparation this morning. You see, the story of Abraham is, is one of the big stories in the book of Genesis. Abraham is a man who I enjoy uh, his story immensely. He's a man who, who fascinates me. I, like many people, have a, a list of questions I'm going to ask when I get to, to heaven. I, you know, I want to ask Abram these questions. What made you go when God told you? What was your reason for saying yes? What made you trust a God you seemingly didn't know so much about? Uh, before we get into Genesis, I want to read uh, from Paul's summary of Abram's life in, in Romans 4. And he he says this, for what does the scripture say? Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He believed in him and he trusted him. Abram is mentioned 60 times in the New Testament. He has a, a huge part to play across scripture. He is lifted in the, the, the hall of fame in Hebrews 11. Yet what we have in our passage this morning is a very real reminder that Abram was human. And like all of us, uh, from time to time, we need reminding of God's promise. And Abram needed reminding of God's promise. Yet the Lord uh, reminded him of this promise in a very real and a very visual way. So let's read together then from Genesis chapter uh, 15. We're going to read uh, the 21 verses uh, together. So Genesis chapter 15, and as you'll see, it is on screen. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my own household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven. And number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought all these and cut them in half and laid each half against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. The Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in the land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. And you shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. 
for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I will give you this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, to the land of the Canites, the Canazites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephahim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. This is the word of the Lord. So you've been studying the character of Abram and the promise that God will make him a great nation. You've seen the ups and downs in his life. He was a man chosen by God. He was elected, or rather rejected, by world leaders for immoral behaviour. He had split from his nephew and rescued him again. Yet with all these ups and downs, we see now a mountaintop experience for Abram. If we take our passage at face value, admittedly it's a very odd way of referring a promise. Yet that is exactly what this passage's purpose is. It's there for God to demonstrate that he will reaffirm his promise to Abraham and ultimately to us. You see, God has made his promise to Abram and is now about to show him in a very real and graphic and visual way that he would understand. Abram's been promised a great nation by God, but he has no children. He asks an honest and straightforward question. How can I be the father of a nation when I am childless? You see, that question had to have rattled around Abram's brain ever since that promise was made to him the first time. See, God tells him to look towards heaven and try and count the number of stars. And as vast as the number of stars is, so vast shall your offspring be. And then Abram had his light bulb moment. He realises that's promise. That's the promise. And with that promise, Abram believed God. Yet God wasn't finished with Abram yet. You see, that the question is, what response do we give when God says, trust me? Do we believe as Abram did, or do we pay lip service to that question and, and go on trying to do things on our own strength? You see, the, the next statement is one of the most important in the whole of Scripture. God accounted his belief as righteousness. Abram was put right with God from that moment. Back to, to Paul in Romans, and he says this, but the words it recounted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up for our, for our, tras our trespasses and raised for our justification. You see, the promise that Abram was given by God stands for us as well. After all, as we'll discover later, we are children of Abraham. We are heirs according to the promise. Yet as we go back to Genesis, we see that, that Abram is about to receive some very odd instructions from God. God tells Abram to engage in some butchery work and to cut a, a whole raft of animals in half. He tells him to, to take a heifer three years old, a, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, and he tells him to take a turtle dove and the young pigeon. God then tells him once he has all these animals, he is to, to cut them in half and to make piles one against the other with a path between them. What we have here is the, the demonstration of a very ancient idea, the act of, of cutting these animals in half and making them into to two separate piles with a, the path between was an act of cutting a covenant. Let's say that, that you and I are going to do some form of deal. Let's say that, that you decide to, to sell me something. We, we agree a price. We have a, a verbal contract. Uh, to, to seal the deal, the two parties involved in this case would walk between the animals and the deal was sealed. What they were saying to each other was this, if the deal was broken, then whoever broke that covenant would be treated uh, like the animals. Uh, just as Jeremiah explains in chapter 34 of his prophecy. And it says this, and the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before we, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two. And passed between its parts. You see in Jeremiah God is, was angry with the people who had not kept his covenant. And he promised that he would deal with them in, a, in the same way as they had dealt with the animal. You see that, that shouldn't surprise us. We, we know that God is a righteous judge who is, who is holy and will not have sin in his presence. So it shouldn't surprise us that God will deal with his people who do not heed his words. 
You see, in Genesis, however, and particularly this chapter in, in chapter 15, we're about to get a, a glimpse, a characteristic of God that, shall we say, we're a bit more comfortable with. We are about to get a glimpse of God's promise to us, a promise to encourage us and to give us hope. So Abram uh, obliges, and after his afternoon's butchery work, he, he falls into a deep sleep, and God affirms his promise. God tells Abram all that is to happen to his descendants. What God was about to do now was give, God, was give Abram something that we all need from time to time. An event that strengthens our confidence in God. You see, the trick that Satan pulls to, to shake our confidence in God is to, to question his word to us. He did it in the garden. He asked Eve, what did God really say that? When our confidence in God fails, we can be away from him. Abram needed an event to restore confidence in God. You see, there are times in our lives when we need events to draw confidence in God. And God gives them to us. We have these mountaintop experiences just like Abram did. And yet we read about these events in scripture where God would remind his people that he is their God. We are his children. And it is his promise to us. You see, to really understand this passage, we need to understand that the word covenant has two meanings. The first and something that is probably more widely known is an agreement. Think of the, the context of the covenant Jesus talked about when he called the, the cup in communion, the cup of the new covenant in my blood. It was an agreement between uh, us and God that if we believed in Christ, then we would have our reward uh, in the next life. You see, the other meaning of the word covenant is a legal term. And the vast majority of us, if we're honest, find reading legal language as about as exciting as watching paint dry. We will happily tick any terms and conditions box without reading a single word. Legal language, by design, is boring, with one exception. That is, if the legal language is on a document that starts with the words last will and testament. That, friends, is a document that will make us sit up and take notice, particularly if our name is mentioned as a beneficiary. Then we are interested in legal language. Then we are interested. And see, that's its second meaning of the word covenant. And it's that meaning that underpins what is happening between Abram and God. Look at verse 17. It will appear on screen. When the sun had gone down, God himself appeared as a smoking fire plot and a flaming torch. And these things passed between the pieces. You see, God had made the covenant with Abram. Abram had nothing to do with it. God passed between the pieces while Abram was sound asleep. God had made the agreement. God had made the promise. I mentioned a, a last will and a testament. And if you were fortunate enough to be left something in my will, you would have done nothing to earn it. This is what God is doing by showing Abram this vision. It is God saying, I will make this covenant with you. You don't have to do anything other than trust me. It is all on me. You see, God has made the same promise for those of us who are Christians. For you to have a relationship with me, the creator God... All you have to do is trust in my son Jesus. You see, you don't have to do anything other than that. Trust in Christ. I have done it for you. I have walked between the pieces. I have done it in my son Jesus' death on the cross. Hebrews 8 says this. The writer is in the middle of, of discussing and showing God's covenants. And he writes these words for us in verse 12. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities. And I will remember their sins no more. That is God's promise to us as people who trust him. You see, to quote John Lennox, our security lies in the new covenant made on the cross where God fulfilled the conditions. And what we have to do is trust him. You see, this event between Abram and God was used by God to give Abram the thing that I said earlier that we all need from time to time. It was an event that gave Abram confidence in God. It gave Abram confidence in God because God has never broken a promise. And it can give us confidence in the fact that God has sent his only son to deal with our sin. And as a result, we will one day be in heaven with him. 
in the good of that promise. God has committed himself to Abram and Abram had to trust God. Abram trusted in God and believed him. He took him at his word. Do we, we here who sit in the promise, we here who are beneficiaries of God's grace, we here who are beneficiaries of God's mercy, do we really trust that God has done it for us? You see, if we are Christ, then we are Abram's offspring. We are heirs according to the promise that I said earlier on. You see, the inheritance that we get from God is an inheritance that will neither spoil nor fade. It is a home in glory, a home for God for eternity. It's the fact that Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, then one day I will return to take you to be where I am. That's the promise from God. That's the promise that was made at the covenant of the cross. Like Abraham, from time to time we ask the Lord, I am sure, how am I to know? How am I to know that your promise is true? Take heart in this. The Lord has never broken a promise. He is a God who can we can trust with the most precious thing we have, our lives and our very existence. You see, God gives Abram a glimpse of what would happen to the nation that would come from Abraham. God tells him that they would, would be sojourners in the land that they would inherit, but only after years of slavery. That is a huge promise for a man who up until this point is childless. In his word we are promised huge things. That we, just like Abram, have to believe what God says when he promises them to us. He has made the promise. He walked between the pieces. He has done it for us. Leon Cass in the book I mentioned earlier put it this way. Abram's fame and the rest of God's promises will not be so much won as bestowed. A gift of providence to which the Lord here pledges himself unconditionally. We can easily take that statement and apply it to our lives. We have not won our salvation. Our salvation has been bestowed upon us. Behold what manner of love, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we, that we should be called the children of God. You see, Abram's continuing trust in God is based on his belief that God is just and will keep his promises. The basis of the gospel is this, that God has done something and will do something about it. And we, all we have to do is receive and we do not earn it. You see, Abram is given assurance and certainty by God. And as we live in a world that is uncertain and unassured, we can have assurance and certainty in God, just like Abraham. So as I close, I do so with verse 15. Abram has promised this, you shall go to your fathers. You see, this is a, a circumlocution used by God to mean death. And yet in this context, it is used by God to mean ongoing life. Abram would go to the father's side as a man who trusted God. We are a people who will go to see the father face to face as a people who trusted God. The life that we have with Jesus, life eternal, that is his promise. You see, God's promise to us is eternity. We will go to be where God is and God will send Jesus himself to come and get us. It's a promise. It's a covenant. And it was nothing to do with us. It was all of God. He did it. He walked between the pieces. It was all of Christ. I hope you found encouragement in the Lord's word this morning. Thank you for watching. I hope you are encouraged and, and to trust God and to find assurance in him, just as Abram did. And uh, as I leave you, may the Lord bless and keep you as you go into this week.